Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another very special episode of Man Up. This is the fifth episode of this little experiment of men coming together who desire to really focus on the difficult things that challenge us, that are going to cause us to be the best God made us to be. So if you're here, God has you here for a purpose. And we invite women who are attuned to eavesdrop. Invite your husbands, invite your sons, get the word out. You can find out more about this at Pentecost365.us. But it is Man Up with Greg Walt. And Mike, and uh, we have a special guest tonight, a very special guest, Father Nathan Cromley. He's a member of the community of St. John. He's founder and president of Eagle Eye Ministries, but most importantly, he's a native of Toledo, Ohio, a beloved son, brother to us of Toledo, Ohio. So we are live over the radio and throughout the planet on YouTube, Facebook at Pentecost365.us. If you want to see, it's not necessary if you're hearing us on the radio, but you'll see some of the images and our interaction here. So we do encourage you to go there, as well as hearing some of the past very powerful episodes. We talked about porn with uh, Pastor Bo. We talked about, um, you know, in the family, really living it with Justin Fatica. We had the QB coach from the Saints, Joe Lombardi. Uh, some really awesome guests. We had Joe Campo, founder of Grassroots Films. So you're going to find some really excellent episodes that I think are going to challenge and encourage you. And we conclude this first season tonight where we're going to go deep into what are the seven disciplines of a godly Catholic man. If you are at the screen right now at Pentecost365.us, you're going to see our logo. It says, man up. And creatively, the U of the up is that turnaround sign that you see in the road. It's kind of an invitation for all of us together to be honest, to ask the question, are we going in the right direction? Because most of us, if not in our actions, then in our attitudes, we're facing the wrong direction. And God invites us to turn around and live in the fullness of our nature in him, to face him and to do that together. There's no shame in that. We face that together. We invite you to be at that place, wherever you're at right now, just humble acknowledgement. We know we're destined for eternity. Can we see where we're going though and aim in the right direction? And that may involve the turnaround. You're also going to see there a fire. Why? Because we men love to get in the outdoors. Father uh, Father Nathan's mission is all about getting brothers and sisters in the outdoors to encounter God fully alive in our Catholic faith in the beautiful world that he's created for us. And so we men in particular, you see the fire here crackling, get yourself a scotch. Father can't offer that to the teens that he leads. But you know, if you're with us, cigar scotch that's all good gather around this fire being real talking about things that really matter in our lives it's an image we want but also from luke 12 49 on this veritable eve of pentecost think about this almost 2,000 years ago if we were to ask the question of jesus lord what was your mission what's your vision what are we all about well in luke 12 49 he said i've come to set the earth on fire and how i wish it were already ablaze Do we yearn for this? We will not be fulfilled, brothers, until we embrace this, which is within us, I believe, and find this, take the steps to make it happen. So folks, we're called to live inside out. We're called to discover his fire alive within us in the Holy Spirit and to claim this world for him. So to set the stage tonight, I have two big questions for all of us men. Number one, have you ever participated a powerful faith event? retreat, conference, where you just left thinking, I'm invigorated, this is awesome. It awakened me to God's love alive. Second question, even more challenging, since we're about asking hardball questions, what lasting impact did that event have in your life? Do you have a committed daily prayer life, for instance, as a result of that? Are you actively making your home a culture of ever deepening encounter with Jesus Christ? Let me ask more specifically, when's the last time you spent 45 minutes in meaningful conversation and prayer with your wife and your children in your home? Here's the thing, we have more Catholic programs right now than ever before in history, but if we're not being transformed transformers, most particularly in our marriages and homes, it's likely we're not making disciples. It's likely we're making program junkies. That sounds hardcore, but let's just face it. Let's just look squarely. Are we being transformed transformers? Are our marriages and families different? Most of us fall short. This is not meant to beat us up. It's meant to recognize that bar that God appoints and anoints us to, to embrace it. So in this episode, we want to speak to the heart of men because we know you've been made for excellence. We've all been made for excellence. We know you've got the passion in your heart for the gospel. Brothers, let's just name what it is. We are at war. 
And if we're not taking territory, territory is being taken. On this eve of Pentecost, grace is being poured out. Men, wherever you're at, this is a prophetic moment for us. If you're not in it, we're challenging you to get in the game. And if you're in it, we invite you to know you're not alone and to be united all the more. In this episode, we're going to discuss the seven disciplines of a Catholic man, not simply during Advent or during Lent special seasons of grace outpour, but what are the everyday disciplines God calls us to to receive grace outpoured. And you can follow along with us at Pentecost365.us. So that sets the stage for us in this program. First of all, let's meet our co-hosts. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, Walt and Mike. Let's begin with Mike. Hey, Greg. Nice to talk with you again. Walt, always great to see you. Mm -hmm. Mike Waskich from Huron, Ohio, just south of Toledo, father of uh, eight precious kids uh, from 22 all the way down to five, five girls, three boys, and uh, my beautiful wife, Janine, of 20, almost 24 years this summer. Awesome. I'm Walt Erickson from Ottawa Lake, Michigan, which uh, don't worry, I'm not like that close to the crazies. I'm really more of Ohioan. Right over the border. Married for 16 years with uh, six beautiful babies. And we attend Holy Trinity in Assumption, Ohio, with two of Father Nathan Crowley's brothers, by the way. That's awesome. And in order to introduce Father Nathan, you see the screen if you're at Pentecost365.us. We want to get his awesome ministry out there, for which he is founder and president, eagleeyeministries.org. And let's just watch this short minute and a half clip of Father kind of sharing a little bit about what that's about. And then he'll share briefly a little bit of his background and current uh, ministry. Every single person who hears the call of Christ needs to respond to it. What is your response going to be? Is it going to be about you or is it going to be about the future? If it's about you, it'll die with you. If you take that response and you invest it in the future, your response will set off a, a, a chain of responses that will continue down through history. We got to pass on a legacy that's deeper than what our own lives can bear. We have to, pay, we have to pass down a legacy of the spirit. And that legacy of the spirit of openness, of proclamation, that's the legacy of Eagle Eye. Getting behind Eagle Eye Ministries means getting behind young people who will give their lives for the sake of Christ and to dedicate themselves to the mission of his evangelization. We want to form young people who, who have the gumption to stand for something and proclaim it from the rooftops. The generation that John Paul II came to America asking for Americans engaged in the modern city with a vision of transforming it and claiming it for Christ. You invest in Eagle Eye, means investing in young people. And investing in young people means claiming the future mm. for God. That's a worthy proposition. I want to meet that guy. And there he is, Father Nathan Cromley in the flesh, present with us right now. Welcome to our program, Father Nathan. Just give us a little bit of the background of you and uh, what you're doing right now with Eagle Eye. Well, you know, the, the idea is just we all have a life to live. What are we going to live it for? And I just decided to give mine away and uh, live it for the Lord. So I followed the Lord as a priest. I've been a, a consecrated religious since the age 22. So I'm about to turn 44 this year, which means I'll been a wearing this for as long as I was not wearing one. And that's kind of a neat uh, milestone in my life. Um, and so what I try to do is I try to form leaders. I want to send leaders to labor in the Lord's harvest. I want to raise up saints and put them into leadership positions. Because if we, I think the big crisis of today isn't on the outside of the church. It's not all the evil things that are happening. All that's just corruption. All that means is it's a lack of what, of what should be there. So what I want to do is instead of spending my time battling against that, I want to build up what's over here and all that will just fly away in the presence of true leadership. So my ministry is to inspire, equip, and engage uh, leaders for the Lord's harvest and send them out there into the world. And so that's what we do. So Eagle Eye Ministries is where we inspire young adults uh, to see their greatness in the eyes of Christ. And then they can come to the St. John Leadership Institute here in Denver, spend two years with me to be really formed and to apply faith with marketable skills 
so that we really have competent lay leaders in the world. And then I work preaching and raising up heads of families mm. uh, and then leaders in business through the National Leadership Network. So those three kind of ministries work together with the same purpose, and that is to take back our culture by taking back our souls. That is awesome. So blessed to have you united with us. And folks, you're tuned in to Ignite Radio Live on radio. And uh, it's an outreach of mass impact. And Pentecost 365 is a particular outreach um, of mass impact. And it's a, a challenge encouragement to men to live it abundantly. And uh, in this episode, we are going to go to Pentecost365.us. We want to share with you um, just this invitation for us men to live and walk in the abundance of our appointing and anointing as men. So um, not necessary that you see us at Pentecost365.us over video. We will talk you through it over the radio. But we're going to identify these seven disciplines of a Catholic man, of a godly man. Each of us, Walt, Mike, and myself, will introduce one, maybe share a brief little story for each of us. And uh, Father, we're going to invite him to kind of color it in a little bit. So if you go to the site right now, you're going to see, um, of course, the banner that says Pentecost 365. And it says, we are Catholic men striving to be ignited in everyday faith. So that's maybe what distinguishes this from other wonderful, excellent things like Exodus 90. This is not um, a consideration of what we might do for a special season of grace. We are about asking the question, what is the bare minimum? What is the foundation that Catholic men ought to be disciplined in receiving that grace being outpoured? Since we began this a little over a year ago, if you look at this site, you'll see we are very blessed by the support of Bishop Thomas Olmstead from Phoenix and Bishop Kevin Rhodes from uh, Fort Wayne South Bend. Then you'll see on the right side a long list of very wonderful, dynamic Catholic male leaders in this country, uh, to name a few, Greg Alexander, Joe Campo, Patrick Coffin, of course, Father Nathan Cromley here with us, Dan Demite, Justin Fatika, John Mark Grodi, Michael Hernan, Peter Herbeck, Ralph Martin, Patrick Rice, Father John Rick. Ricardo, Devin Schott, Bob Schutz, Tim Staples, Father Matthias Thalen, John Wood, and Ken Yasinski. So these are among a few of those who are engaged with this. So you're not alone. You're with men who want to say yes. Um, and these are the seven, again, disciplines. We'll say that a number of times. And with no further ado, we're just going to dive into these disciplines and enumerate them for you. And I think, Mike, you lead us off with discipline number one. Actually, Walt, you lead us off with discipline number one. First one is the sacraments. A reading from the Catechism. Grace is a participation in the life of God. It introduces us into the intimacy of Trinitarian life. Minimally, we commit to Sunday Mass and monthly confession. Um, so, my wife drugged me to Mass uh, when we first got married and uh, didn't have any issue with, with the Catholic Church, really didn't, but I just, I didn't understand the reason, didn't understand the purpose. Um, but very quickly, for whatever reason, grace of God, I believed in this, in the, I believe that Jesus Christ was present, like physically present. And it started to piss me off that so many of these Catholic people sit in the pews, like just didn't care. Uh, you could just tell they just didn't care. Um, and so uh, that was one of the two main reasons that I wanted to actually come into the Catholic Church in time is because it's like I'm here, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I believe in the most important thing the Catholic Church teaches, which is the true presence of receiving Christ and the you know sacrifice of the Mass, and I can't receive him, hmm. but I know he's really there. So, anyways, um, uh, that's my that's my tidbit on the sacraments, the most important sacrament. Well, you know, I think when you know to pick up on that, Walt. A lot of people are involved in the church, but they don't seem to really understand why they're there. That's that. And won't, the whole point of what we're trying to do here, folks, is to open our minds to that truth. Because the more that am amazing that you understand the sacraments are, the more powerful they can work in your life. Here's the truth about the sacrament. When you go in a sacrament, you become real. You hear all the time about people, I don't understand why I'm Catholic, I don't understand why, what's the point of going to church, what's the point of, you know, and I'm like, that's because we've had a problem of divorcing our heart and our body. Mm. 
And we we're just like, oh no, I'm people of the heart. I'm a nice guy. You know, as if the point of our life was to be a nice guy. I bet Pontius Pilate was a nice guy, everybody. I mean, you know, he didn't get to be where he was by being a meanie. He probably was really nice at parties. He probably, you know, Pontius Pilate, he condemned Jesus Christ to death. Big mistake. Nice guys make all kinds of big mistakes. There are all kinds, you know, the there was a, some of the Nazis who were like the most wor worthless people in the history of the world. They walked around. Their kids were like, my dad was a really nice guy. You know, so like not being a nice guy, that's a question of the heart. Being a saint that's a question of the heart in the body. And what the sacraments force you to do is to do something and not just sit there and think that you're a success because you want to be. We have this mentality of spirituality. It was just like, oh, well, Jesus just loves me. He's going to give me everything. You want. So as Jesus is just, you know, I don't have to do anything. Jesus is going to do it for me. And I was like, that's not the gospel, folks. I'm really sorry. That's not the gospel. Mm -hmm. What I see with Jesus is, Jesus looks at him and is like, yeah, I'll get you to walk on water. That's cool. But you got to get out of the boat. you got to put your feet on the waves, man. And then so when it comes to it, are you getting out of the boat? You won't even get out of your car to go to confession. Mm. And you're going to be sitting there like, oh, I could do that. Yeah, if Jesus called me out of the boat, man, he might ask me to have another kid. I, I, I would do it. No, you wouldn't. If you don't do the little things, you won't do the big ones. And the little things, they're things you actually do. So when it comes to the sacraments, what's amazing about it is it's stuff that's physical. This is what opens up the whole awesomeness of being a Catholic, is that we got these guys named priests who actually have powers that you don't have. Now, you have wonderful things that priests don't have. You know, we're all, everybody gets a blue ribbon in life here. But that <laughs> priest blue ribbon is pretty cool because what our blue ribbon is, is that I have the authority of Jesus Christ as a priest to bring you salvation through seven means. And what are those seven means? We know the seven sacraments. But what do they all entail? Something physical. People all the time come to me, I don't know why I got to go confession to a priest. I'm like, who are you going to go to confession to? Well, to God directly. When was the last time you did that? Last time you looked at porn, did you seriously mm. go to God and, and say you're sorry? Did you really? No, mm. you didn't because you saw it the last 30 times and you feel like you're defeated in life. So you're not even saying you're sorry anymore. No, I got down on both knees. Really? How many times? I'm challenging you on that because I don't, I think you're full of it. If you really want to repent, then go back like the prodigal son. Imagine mm -hmm. prodigal son. He's sitting there like eating the pods from the swines. And he's just like, dad, I'm really sorry. You know what I mean? And dad's like, I'm in Indiana kid. And he's like, well, I'm yelling from Toledo. I guess it counts. Dad's like, if you're really sorry, dude, come home. If you want to repent from your sins, get in your car and drive your priest, get on your knees, go to confession. Physicality, that's what marks the wonder of the sacraments. And why it's important is because what you do in your body, you actually do. And when you look at all seven of those, I want to challenge you all the minimal commitment of hmm. Sunday Mass. It's a huge challenge if you don't do it. And I want to just applaud you for like being willing to take that challenge, but I'm telling you, it'll change everything in your life. What you got to do is not go to mass thinking what you're going to get out of it. You got to say, I'm going to mass in order to give God praise, give God adoration, give God thanks, and to beg him for a blessing on my family for that week. And when you shift that attitude to being not about you, but about him and about your family, well, then it suddenly becomes something that you're eager to do. Because it's the one thing you can do that will transform your life the most. Father, you rocked it out. That was amazing. Um, and set the foundation, really, the first, receiving that grace in the sacraments is the basis of all others. And we are, too, in this modern age, analytical. We may not see grace flowing, but it is real and it is powerful. And um, to keep this moving, we're going to go right on to the second discipline. Let's go to Mike. All right. Hey, thanks, Greg. Daily personal prayer. Dedicated personal prayer is the cornerstone of the spiritual life. Minimally, we commit to 20 minutes a day in undistracted, dedicated prayer. This includes the daily reading and reflection and prayer by Regnum Christi and cultivating the inner sanctuary. Be still and know that I'm God. So just a couple of uh, brief comments. You know, um, I had a, a, a great couples retreat with Greg and his wife last fall up in Michigan and 
really that uh, up my prayer life. My, my family and I, we do do a, a, a rosary. We think, as Joe Campo mentioned last week, that's the most powerful weapon that Mary gave us. And so we do that uh, pretty, pretty diligently uh, daily. Uh, but I, I needed to up my game. And so actually my wife, who holds me accountable, she texts me the Regnum Christi uh, link every day on my phone. So she knows I'm on my phone doing my work and boom, it's right there. I can't ignore it. It's very physical to actually have to go there and read it. And, and some days we actually talk about it. And, and so it's a great, quick spiritual guide. Um, and then again, also I mentioned Joe from last week, just talking to God throughout the day. You know, thank you for this beautiful sunlight. Thank you for the blessings of, of a day that we can go outside and get some fresh air and, you know, do what you're asking us to do. So that's my daily challenge. And I'm trying to not just, you know, individually have that uh, prayer life, talk about it with my wife and kids. Um, what did that scripture say? How does that actually play out here in 2020? What was Christ or what were the apostles going through 2000 years ago that apply today? And so really trying to live it beyond just that, that hour on Sunday, that's a, a really a bare minimum. Awesome. Well, you know, Mike, I think that to speak to that, like, you know, what you're describing there is, you know, what a lot of folks really need to discover. If I'm going to lead anyone anywhere, I have to have a vision, right? So when I look at it, I say, why aren't Catholics engaged? Why aren't we engaged in our family, et cetera? I think a lot of us are just like, well, I just don't know like what the point is. When we pray every day, it's like feeding the heart of that leadership inside of us. If a, a person who prays is in touch with the ultimate goal, and then the rest of their lives focuses in on that vision. So I want to emphasize that because a lot of guys don't know why they should pray every day. They're like, I talk to God, I kind of throw stuff out. I understand. But when you make yourself the measure of your prayer life and you don't instead make the, your prayer life the measure of yourself, mm. right? What you end up doing is just limiting your vision to what you already know. The thing about prayer is it's a wild exercise. It's like getting near fire. Fire does, you, you don't consume fire, fire consumes you. And when you go into that prayer life like Moses every day on the holy mountain of God, man, you don't know what he's going to do with you that day. But that's what's so amazing, because then you're able to take that spirit, that encounter with God, and you're able to lead your family and the people who are underneath you forward because you're fed with that inner mm -hmm. encounter. It's almost like what they say about leaders. They say the majority of leaders, I think CEOs and companies, are something like 80% are introverts. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we look at the greatest leaders in history, they were almost all introverts because where it comes from is this spirit of leadership inside that vision that then they take to the outside and they bring people with them. That's what prayer, their, your daily prayer life is all about. I want to tell you this. If you pray every day, you will be able to be more effective in communicating with your spouse, more effective in claiming your own life, more effective in having confidence in what you do because your foundation and your rock will be God. <laughs> Maybe like, can I repeat that? Like, what is what else do you want as your foundation in your rock, folks? Because they're all like, no, 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 my foundation is myself. Seriously, are you really that awesome? No, you're not, and you know it. <laughs> How well then? Why wouldn't I replace what I've got as my rock and foundation with God? Mm. I mean, I'm going to be unstoppable. Exactly. How do you do that? It's by praying from your heart, relinquishing control, honoring Him as your head on a regular basis. And when you honor him as your head, guess what your wife will do? She'll start honoring you as her head because she will respect the man who respects God. And when you can't respect God, what message do you think you're giving her? You think she's going to be like, oh, no, you respect me. And you're like, yes, I, I can't stand God, but I'm going to honor you. It's like, no. The moment you honor God, you're demonstrating for her security, and she will honor you because you honor someone greater than you. It's just the truth. Father, that was awesome. Folks, you're with us in this special episode of Man Up. You can find it at Pentecost365.us. 
We're about getting oriented in the right direction, being united as brothers, as godly men, husbands and fathers. And we're going through the seven disciplines that we ought to receive, the occasions to receive grace every day, not just in special seasons. And the third of these, if you're with us online, you can see as we're going through this, is fasting on Fridays. The church asks us to fast. Minimally, we commit to one full meal and two smaller meals that together do not equal one meal. We invite you to a more rigorous fast involving abstaining from breakfast and lunch, snacks and beverages, excluding water throughout the day. So for me, I've always uh, grew up with that practice of fasting, and I always understood at some level the value of it, of surrendering, simply put, lesser things for greater. But this past year, I began reading, you look over my left shoulder if you're online and you see us, the books, the red books on the shelf up there, Catherine Emmerich, they're the series of her visions and revelations. And when I read the passage about the battle between Jesus and the devil in the desert, it strikes me that never... No place else in scripture do you see such a evident encounter of Christ with Satan as in that episode. Why is it so vigorous? Well, it's because Satan wasn't maybe quite sure that this was the Son of God or the Messiah. He was trying to figure it out, didn't quite get it. The audacity of God taking on flesh and blood. But he saw this tremendous godly person doing what? Going into the desert to fast. And it must have had a powerful impact, a nuclear impact on the kingdom of hell because Satan was threatened by Jesus fasting. So that alone struck me in reading and reflecting upon that, along with that scripture passage that certain demons and things will not be conquered without fasting. So um, with that in my mind, um, at some point in my fasting regimen, I began asking and just maybe tempted, why does this matter? Hearing the same voices that maybe Satan uh, was attacking Jesus with. You know, what does it really matter? Why are you doing this? What's the point? And I was really sincerely praying this, Lord, why are you having me fast? What's the point of all this? Um, And the next day I saw an awesome video from a good brother of ours, Dan Demite, who shared the brief, I'll the story briefly. He had been driving up the road and a woman who looked was limping and looked beat up. He pulled over and, you know, asked her for, you know, gave her a ride, offered a ride and she accepted this. And she proceeded to share that she was basically a prostitute and had just, the heck got beaten out of her. And Dan prayed with her as he describes this tearful moment of this woman who's, who knows her background with drug abuse and and, uh, abuse every moment of her life. uh, Dan prayed for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for her to know her dignity as a daughter of Christ. And he punctuated this story by, at the end of it, by saying, brothers, I've never been more convinced that we need to fast and pray, but particularly we've got to fast to unease, if you will, the strongholds of the, of the enemy's dominion in this world. Through fasting, we surrender, if you will, our control to things in this world and become kindred and connected with the power of God on high. So that's my brief story. Father, lay it on us. Well, you know, I appreciate that, Greg. And, and a lot of times when we look at fasting, we say, oh, it means that I'm supposed to, you know, deprive myself of earthly pleasures or whatever. Let me put it from a little bit more of a positive perspective. And that is that what fasting is, it's you actually claiming your life. Hmm. Fasting is not about you like, well, I guess I got to give up ice cream. It's about you saying, I guess I get to become able to give up ice cream. Because a lot of us, let's be honest, we're not even in control of our own bodies. We, we, so when the kids go crazy, we get angry. What is that all about? Kids were born crazy. That's the nature <laughs> of a kid. Well, and then you're like, I'm going to get angry because of the kids, right? I am not going to do that. I'm going to get stubborn because you're nagging me. I'm going to get all anxious because of Fauci. You know, whatever you want to be. <laughs> Everybody else in your life is just pulling your strings and you're just a little victim, right? Give me a break. When you fast, what you do is you practice your manhood. Mm. You you learn to take control because of what you want to do. So that this is what's so crucial. It's for you to be like, I am not a slave to food. Mm. I am not a slave to alcohol. I'm not a slave to cigars. Neither, therefore, am I going to be a slave of what other people think of me or a slave of my own emotions. Everything else in your life will fall together in order the moment that you take your life back. That, so I understand we surrendered all the God. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about the basic control of your will over yourself. That exercise, voluntarily done, is what fasting is all about. So if you can't fast, or if you complain about fasting, you absolutely need to do it, because I can guarantee you, if you can't, if you know, not have pretzels on a Friday night, there's a million other things that you can't do either. But the moment you start to say, I can, in fact, deny myself from pretzels, beer, and hockey on Friday, well, then the moment you'll also be able to control your anger, get your lawn mowed, shave, whatever else it is that you find so incredibly difficult to do in your life. Jesus knows what he's doing. When he says you got to fast, it's not because of some sort of mystical reason only. Hmm. It's also because, darn it all, if you're not able to control your life, someone else will be. Hmm. That, my friends, is just dangerous. It's awesome. Walt did, you, Walt, did you feel judged when I pointed my finger at the camera when he was talking about pretzels on a Friday night? I felt loved, actually. Good. Good. That's all of us. But criticism well. Yeah, we we love you, man. What Walt? But you know, nobody else has five times the body mass of an average person like myself. You know, we know you'll die if you're not consuming calories. It's just the way it is. So it no, is that scary. It is scary how much I eat. No, it's it that's awesome. As long scary. as it's gluten free, Walt. Just <laughs> gluten free. They, they are. I got kids. I have to eat them. The, the, actually, the pretzels aren't that bad. The gluten free pretzels aren't that bad. You know, Father Nathan, else you know, we, we think that you may be in the CIA. Do you have a camera on my house? Because, like, what you just described was, like, I think you're watching me, like, through Project Echelon or something. I mean, can you even admit that on the Internet right now? I you can tell you'll have to kill you. I did, Mike. I'd have to kill you for this. <laughs> Father Mike is part of Q- – Father Nathan's part of QAnon. That's awesome. Hey, folks, glad you're with us again uh, for our listening audience. This is Man Up over Ignite Radio Live, and um, you can follow the live video at Pentecost365.us. We're going over the seven disciplines of a godly Catholic man. The first was sacraments, the second daily prayer. We just covered the third one, which is the Friday fast, and now we're going to go to Walt on weekly adoration. A holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament is worth more than a thousand years of human glory. Padre Pio. Minimally, we commit to a weekly visit, but highly recommend an entire hour. I, I lift five, you know, five, six days a week and um, just got sick of listening to music, you know, uh, while I, I was lifting. So I'm like, I need something, you know, powerful, entertaining, you know, uh, good for me. And so it's like, you know, sometimes I felt when I was lifting, it was it was selfish of my time. So it's like, I might as well, I might as well learn, I might as well uh, grow in my faith. So uh, uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, I think I've listened to every single one of his like uh, TV, you know, 25 minute things, like, I don't know, 20 times. And uh, when I listened to his documentary, like he, he, he did an hour of adoration every single day of his life, every day. And... Uh, I believe he actually died in adoration hmm. is what I, is what I, I, I believe how he passed away. And he talks about, you know, that it's just, it's, it's profound and you actually do get spoken to. And so, uh, when we, when we started doing adoration, uh, weekly at mass, you know, I go in from my hour, it was 10 to 11 PM and, uh, I'm tired. I am tired. I get up early. And so I like to go to bed early and, um, uh, but I started going to adoration, didn't really know what to do other than I knew you're supposed to like be quiet and like try to pray. Right. And um, in time, I actually found myself excited to go, hmm. like excited to go. Not because not because like I felt like he was just speaking to me all the time, but just being in God's church uh, by yourself for an hour in front of him is just it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And so I I. I went from doing it obediently to doing it willingly. Mm. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in this uh, uh, communist-controlled uh, coronavirus shutdown, right? And I, you can't really do it, and I, I miss it. I miss it. And mm. I cannot wait until we can go back to, uh, to do an adoration again. So that's my adoration story. Awesome. Thanks, Walt. Father Nathan. You know, the thing about adoration is that it makes you poorer. And what I mean by that is that it's an hour that you spend where you give. You give your, I mean, an hour 
plus the drive time. Whoa. That's why we're like, hey, at least a minimal visit. Even that minimal visit will cost you. Now, this is where where a lot of guys end up stopping because we're like, oh, because, I mean, like, it's too hard. I'll pray in bed, right? This is a great way. I'll pray in bed. You know, it's like, I want you to think about it. What adoration does practically is it really forces you to have a God. Meaning there is a no, yep, there is another burden put on your shoulders in life. And if you're going to do all these other burdens, I've got to have a cookout on Memorial Day. I've got to have a cookout when Ohio State beats Michigan again. I've got to have a Super Bowl party. You you know, like we don't complain about this stuff. I've got to wash my clothes. I've got to do it. So we're just like, I don't want God to be a burden. Stop. The moment that you accept that God burden is the moment that you actually benefit Mm -hmm. from God's love in your life in a very practical way. I think our religion's problem, what we live in our religion's problem, is that we don't embrace that opportunity to give and to sacrifice. Love speaks the language of sacrifice. Mm. The more you give to the one you love, the more that the one who loves actually lives in your life. Mm. Think of it this way. What if I were to say, I, I'm going to talk to my wife on the phone every day. I'll send her a text. I don't have time. It's too hard to talk to him. My 16-year-old son, oh, my gosh, you know what? Like, I just can't handle the fact that I have to talk with them. So, okay, you could do that. You could do that. What's going to happen? Your relationship's going to die. Because you're 16 years old, you don't care about me, Dad. You'd be like, well, I do care about you in my heart. Look, once a week I talk to you. You know what I mean? It's going to be like, no. You, you And so in the same way it is with God, if it's all about making a Catholic in the pew who doesn't know why they're there, know why they're there, I'll tell you, if you do this single thing of once a week of visit the Blessed Sacrament, you will start to care. Okay? Don't wait to care to start. Mm-hmm. Start in order to learn how to care. It's, just, it's practical advice, and it's the truth. That's awesome. Folks, you're a man up with Greg Mike and Walt, Pentecost365.us. We are inviting you to join us in receiving the grace poured out on a daily basis, going through the seven disciplines for his weekly adoration. Blessed to have Father Nathan Cromley, by the way, unpacking this and preaching to us, hoping hoping our souls are receiving this and that we are moved to uh, lean into making the discipline to receive this. Discipline, again, shares the same root as disciple. This is about becoming a disciple, and I might even add the heart of that is the dispositions. It's not simply disciplines, but it's cultivating that inner life, that Joel 2.13, rend your hearts, not your garments. It's about our hearts through these means of being united with the heart of the Father. These aren't just cold, external things, just do them, and God, you know, somehow magically does his thing. No, these are invitations for us to be intimately united with our God, which is our ultimate purpose. So let's go now to number five with Mike Waskovich. All right. Family leadership. A husband and father is uniquely appointed and anointed by God to preside over the spiritual atmosphere of the home from Ephesians. So we committed ourselves to informing our wives of our commitment and empowering them to hold us daily accountable, a weekly dedicated time of leading our families in meaningful talking and praying, presiding over all media consumption, ensuring time and content is consistent with forming disciples of Jesus Christ and quote, no cell Sundays, no personal digital devices, except if only absolute uh, necessity, particularly on the Lord's day. This is a small way to reclaim the Lord. So again, after I spent that retreat with uh, the Schleters in the fall uh, and they taught us how to use the the group and the family lit guide. And I just read that off uh, right off Pentecost 365. My, My wife and kids and I, we do that uh, religiously every Saturday night. So we'll talk about the, the readings for tomorrow and then we will go through and I make sure it's a, it's a point. I want to put your phones down. Let's turn off some lights and light a candle. Let's listen to each other. Let's tune in and we'll go through those readings. We'll go through some questions. And I find that we're really kind of getting to know each other. You know, what are those things that we're really proud of, either that we accomplished in, as individuals or that you saw your sibling take care of? And it's a, also a moment for vulnerability for, for myself as the, 
spiritual leader of the home to say, you know, I, I really struggled with this at work. Or I'm really struggling with this with someone, you know, in my life. And then that definitely investing of that time, as Father Nathan, Nathan just mentioned, as I get more involved in my wife and my kids' lives and what they're dealing mm-hmm. with on a day-to-day basis and sharing my own issues and challenges and struggles and, and wins, we're investing that time and those relationships are, are really starting to build. We're definitely trying to keep the devices off on Sunday or we greatly reduce those. Mm. Uh, I'm a political junkie. I like to watch all the Sunday shows. So I try to, you know, keep that to a very minimum. Um, and then we just, you know, we, we talk what's mm. going on. Like why are, what, let's, let's not watch a family movie together. Let's uh, go on a walk. Let's uh, let's just have a conversation. Let's go get some work done and I can train you and teach you how to do something, get to know you better. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Father Nathan. You know, at the heart of leadership, everybody, as you know, isn't isn't your relationship with the others. I think a lot of guys, we get intimidated by this. We go, oh my gosh, leadership. Like, I don't know how to do that. Or leadership just sounds kind of macho. I mean, our wives do a better job. I mean, we married up, you know. I don't know many guys who don't think like they married up. I mean, we're all like a total admiration of these women in our in our world. Um, you know, and then the kids kind of take care of themselves. And so wifey takes care of kids. Uh, kids take, you know, have soccer, ballet, you know, football. We just put it all together in a little package. Our job is to keep the machine going. That's what a lot of us feel like, right? Which is again, why we don't engage in our faith. Because our job, we've managed to put our, our life in a minimal perspective. What I'm here to do is basically to like troubleshoot, kind of make sure that wifey can do her job happy wife happy life make her happy she makes the kids happy the kids are happy when they're with their friends their school it's amazing we we have this way to selfie face and we we just like act like we're not important my kids don't need me why my wife doesn't need me my dog needs me and so like you know i'll I'll love my dog and we'll leave my dog i'll make sure my dog's okay you know and then we put our life on mute for like 40 years and then when we hit like our mid sixties, we start to wake up, look around and say like, oh man, what can I do with myself? And by then it's too late. We just watch the news and get mad and throw stuff at the TV. This doesn't have to be the case guys. What's the difference? The difference is when you look at leadership, not as what's needed from somebody, but leadership in certain terms of, first of all, with you, are you living the life that you want to live? Cause if the answer is no, guaranteed everyone whose lives depend upon you their lives are also affected to the negative your absence of claiming your own life is leading them to not have the leadership that they essentially need your wife is not just there to take care of kids she also needs to be taken care of just like you need to be taken care of by her she needs to be taken care of by you and what she needs from that is a man who knows where he's going and who he is. Mm. So I want to go to the heart of this and say, yes, yes, lead your family at how I want you, first of all, to claim yourself Mm. and to ask yourself, am I living the life I want to live? And to ask that truth really hard. And it can be very helpful to ask your wife to ask you that question so you can talk with her about it and flesh it out. But I guarantee you, none of us are. (laughs) We're all close. Put yourself on a scale. I'm 85% of the way there. Okay. That gap analysis is where it enables you then to say, this is where I need to exercise. And I'm telling you, if you start to fill that gap, everyone around you will have to start to fill theirs. Father, you are rocking it out for us. So grateful to have you with us on Man Up as we're going through these seven disciplines of a godly man, occasions of receiving grace in everyday life. Again, repeating from the beginning, sacraments, number one, daily personal prayer, number two, Friday fast, number three, weekly adoration, number four, just covered family leadership and the challenge for us to be claimed. And uh, we're going to go to number six now, brotherhood, encouragement, accountability. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron. As a context for prayer, encouragement, and accountability, as brothers, we commit to two things. Gathering monthly with committed brothers in our region for an hour of prayer, personal report, and encouragement. And secondly, we become a mission partner with another brother with whom we will report weekly, specifically on our success with each commitment as an occasion of prayer, accountability, and encouragement. So, 
we get this in the world of sports, business, and school. We get the necessity of surrounding ourselves with people who are committed to the same things and committed to our excellence. That probably was showcased or never better showcased than in the ESPN series that just completed uh, featuring Michael Jordan, The Last Dance. In the 1990s, the Chicago Bulls. All of those principles are woven into the success, certainly Michael Jordan, superstar, but he had to hold accountable his team members. He had to challenge the best in them. And I, I guess what, brothers, it involved maybe a little bit of shouting, a little bit of yelling, but in love. In fact, some of them years later said that, you know, to ramp up the team's success at the time, they were a little annoyed with Michael Jordan. They were a little annoyed at that he was so passionate at helping, challenging them to, to be the most that they're made to be. But a year, two, three years later, all of them said, this is exactly what needed to happen. That's what love is. Love speaks with encouragement to the best version of ourselves. And we need a context to do that. It's not just going to happen. It doesn't happen on a battlefield. It doesn't happen again in sports or business. Do we have this in the faith arena? I will just give the proclamation as one of six boys in my family, beautiful youngest uh, sister, but six boys. I've been blessed my whole life to have brothers who love me enough to challenge me to the best version of myself and not settle for silly, stupid whispers of the enemy of kind of, sort of, maybe if you feel like it, you know, if you're comfortable, if it's your style. No, you are made for excellence, Greg, is what they said to me in my life and those who are closest to me. And I want you to be that best of yourself. So I'm going to encourage you. But yes, I can't say this strongly enough. We got to recover a sense of accountability, a sense of I'm holding you to these awesome qualities and attributes that God has woven into your being. I'm holding it to them and I expect them of you. And by the way, this is what needs to overflow into our families. Simple principle for parents, expect of your children what they're able to do all the time. It's that simple. You want excellent kids, expect from them what they're able to do without exception all the time. Obviously, understanding mercy and all of that. But those kids will respond because you're speaking to their integrity and their dignity. So, Father, Nathan. You know, uh, yeah, Greg, totally. And I think a lot of us guys struggle with this uh, question because we like we know it. We actually all want it, obviously. But then the question is how? How do I actually find this group, do this thing? And I, I want to be real practically just speaking to the audience today, not to the guys who do it, but to the guys who are just sitting there going like, all right, I'm stirred, but like, how, what do I do? Practically start with any group that there are of guys. Knights of Columbus, they're, it's an awesome thing to do. Men's, some sort of men's group and anywhere. And then you just wait till you find a relationship or two with a guy you kind of get along with. And then that's where things will just naturally flower. Your first step doesn't have to be a hard one. You could even start virtually. I mean, like, mm. again, start anywhere. I understand that's not the real, we really want to get to a guy's group with accountability. And I want to understand that. That's awesome. But I want to, if you really wanted to start it, even if you started virtually, something like all that we're doing here, Pentecost 365, all that we're doing through all the different apostolates for, uh, that we run, you know, take a look at those things and then start to find an affinity, go to an event at the, if you're open to it, it'll happen. But if you have a self, a self limitation on your mind saying like, I'm never going to find this. I don't have any guys that understand me. I don't like hanging out with guys. Well, then, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I want you to self-fulfill a prophecy of positivity here that you can do it because we all know there's a line in the Bible that says a brother with his brother is a fortified citadel. He will never be overcome. Mm. So being open to it, I will naturally find those that brotherhood that I seek and finding at just one. It was it, you become an impregnable force to the enemy, and I encourage you all there to start and become the self-fulfilling prophecy of your victory instead of your defeat on this issue. That's awesome. So blessed again, folks. We are, gosh, on this eve of Pentecost, two thousand years, just desiring to live in the fullness, to be instruments of the prayer: Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. 
Many of us feel beat up, right? Many of us feel beleaguered. Many of us uh, haven't been surrounding ourselves in a context of excellence. And uh, that's, if nothing else, you can get online and go to this, Pentecost365.us with brothers who are working it out. We're not there. We haven't arrived. But we're, we're taking God at his word that he offers this opportunity for us to receive this grace in these ways. And we're encouraging you to get on the road at Pentecost365.us. We're coming in for a landing here on identifying these seven disciplines. And I'm going to challenge you to sign up, by the way. Haven't yet, but challenge you to sign up to commit yourself beginning Pentecost or whatever time you hear this to seven weeks. Give it a try for seven weeks. Rock solid to say 100%. I am going to do each one of these without exception. I want to see what God will do with my life. I promise you it will be something transformative. It'll be something very powerful. So again, these seven disciplines, we've covered six so far. The sacraments, number one, personal prayer, number two, Friday fast, three, four, holy adoration, five, family leadership, six, we just covered the importance of brotherhood, encouragement, and accountability. And that lands us number seven, an end of day examine. Father Nathan, what words do you have for us about this? No, just uh, any leader, any leader in your business, imagine if you went through, you're the head of your business, you're the head of your department. Imagine if you never allowed yourself to ask how you can improve. Hmm. All of your employees around you are looking at you. They're like, yeah, he doesn't follow through on emails. He promises things and doesn't close the loop in communication. He uh, has a negative attitude. His vision, you know, it never is no never takes anyone's criticism coming up. You would fail. I mean, you would you might be good in many ways, but you would fail to be as excellent as you could be. Any leader in any business needs to have this small circle of people who can criticize them, who he has to be able to do a 360 of those who are around him and be open to to excellence. In the interviews that you do with your employees, you should close by saying, Hey, do you have any comments for me? How I can be a better boss? The one who leads is, of course, the best of servants, and the best of servants is the best of leaders. That's an example of just the practicality of what we're talking about here. In my life with Christ, I'm willing to put myself into question, call my actions into question on a daily basis. Now, there's many ways to do these. You type in, this is great. What you got here, you ask God for light. So you said at the end of your day, you're like, God, give me light. I want to thank you for my all of the good things that I've done today. I actually didn't cuss. That was really cool. I was actually really positive about Obama. You know, that was really cool. I didn't get mad at him today. You know, God bless Obama, whatever it is. And then I'm going to review the day. You know what, though, at the same time, here's where I call myself into question. You know, boom, boom, boom. I face it and I ask for for forgiveness. So as we go through that examine, that's one way. I want to actually do something a lot more specific. Think about one area that you're trying to correct. Like, I don't know, being angry about Nancy Pelosi. So there you go. So you're angry about Nancy Pelosi. You're like, I got to stop cussing about Nancy Pelosi. If that's your problem. And obviously it's nobody's problem here. I'm sure of it. But some of us, seriously, Nancy Pelosi doesn't care about you guys. Why do you care about her? Why are you saying that she lives in your brain? Stop it. Jesus needs to live in your brain. So I got to get over this. It's a type of addiction, you know, throwing darts at different people that I don't like. Stop. It doesn't make any difference. So I'm going to make an examination there. At the end of the day, I go back and I re-examine how did I do here today on there? And I fell three times. Cool. Lord, I'm sorry for that. By working on that, asking for his mercy, you heal that wound and you start to climb up. Ignoring your wounds is a sure way to stay with them. Asking for mercy and humility in front of your wounds is a sure way to stop them. Daily examination of conscience, it's all about repair mechanism. And that's what we all need so that our little star ship can deliver that missile and knock out the Death Star and not go down because of years and years of flack that that took it out right so let's go luke skywalker Hmm. blow this thing up but to do that you need the r2d2 unit in the back it's got to do the repairs that's the daily exam i like how you made that accessible to walt just kind of like took these deep principles and presented in a package he understands if it wasn't going to be weightlifting man 
Star Wars is the way to go. Um, folks, so blessed to have you with us here. Man Up with Mike, Walt, and Greg. The first season, five episodes. You can find out more at Pentecost 365 in a moment. We're going to go to the always coveted or um, anticipated Mike's Marvelous Memes. And we'll land with a blessing with Father Nathan. Um, but just... We are here, we brothers are here, representing thousands of brothers, many you may not even know, but who are near you and yearn to know the truth of their nature and to be united in a journey to live it out courageously, discover the adventure that is life woven into marriage and family in the world. That's what this is really all about. And we just invite you to get on that on board with that journey, challenge you and encourage you at Pentecost365.us. Just before we go to the memes, um, Mike and Walt, any prominent thoughts or words as Father Nathan was bringing it through this awesome episode? Absolutely. I just want to say, you know, I, I love Father Nathan. I just met him. Um, the the practicalness of, like, we, we all work in the real world. And and the, the fact that you kind of bring it from a, a manager, leader, employer, like, with, it's all about talent development and continuous improvement. And you've made that very practical our relationship with God and start with yourself and do the examine and really try to accentuate your strengths and minimize your weaknesses and, and continue to improve and work on those, but quit making it about everyone else. Hmm. Make it about yourself. And, you know, here's a roadmap that Greg has laid out in the seven disciplines that are pretty logical or, or I think simple to follow. So love that you teed this up really nicely hmm. and Father Nathan just hit a grand slam. So thank you. Absolutely. Oh, we love it. We love your daily masses. I, lo- I love your. Uh, I love. I love that you truly, truly love Christ. Hmm. And I think when you truly, truly love Christ, you're able to lead the way that you do, and you do it with humility, and you do it with holy wisdom, and you you do it uh, as perfect as I've ever seen it done. Thank you so much for giving your life to Christ and leading us. Thank you. Absolutely. You. With no further ado, we'll queue up Father after the meme. So we're going to get uh, have a little humor, amusement here, and then we'll land it, obviously, to receive the grace and blessing. So with no further ado, Mike, Mike's memes. So I have a picture here of uh, Teddy uh, Roosevelt complaining about a problem without proposing a solution is called whining people. Uh, and here's a Star Wars reference. Internet tough guy, I sense. A mama's boy. Internet in tough guy, I is. sense. Mama's boy in real life is. Sorry. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Great. All right, so a very manly actor, Vin Diesel. Oh, I thought that was Walt. is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of age. But being a gentleman, well, that's a matter of choice. I actually put this one in there for a while. Be the man God made you to be. And Greg? Yes. Stone Cold Truth. Awesome. Last but not least. When Chuck Norris slices onions, onions cry. (laughs) You want to talk about reversing, you know, like that, not them, me. You know, Chuck Norris is the model, at least the, the the creature that could be the model for us. Uh, but uh, honestly, Jesus Christ is our model. So, so I'll, I'll give it back to Greg. That's awesome. Folks, again, you've been with us. Man up with Mike Walton, Greg, an experimental desire to just keep it real in this program, to identify the difficult, challenging areas where God wants to mold us into being outstanding men of God. By the way, the apostles didn't start that way. They all failed numerous times. But the grace of the Holy Spirit deeply moved them, and we've received that Holy Spirit. Thus, Pentecost 365, the 365 meaning every day. He's pouring it forth, and he's given us the opportunity to receive it. We invite you to receive it by joining us in embracing these seven disciplines. I'm going to say try it on for seven weeks. Without exception, not kind of, sort of, not maybe, not if it feels good, but declare right now, I want to receive God's grace. In in each of these seven ways, I'm going to do it. Go to Pentecost365.us and you can find out more about that. And we're now going to uh, thank Father Nathan for being 
in the sandbox with us in this arena and the battlefield, informing us, inspiring us, speaking truth to us, and uh, certainly as a priest of God, so grateful for all of you priests out there in uh, your sacrifice and being occasions of God's grace poured out in the sacraments. And so we'll conclude this first season and this last episode of this season um, with Father's blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and all your patron saints, may Almighty God stir up the fire of grace within you and the courage to respond to his call and give you all the graces you need to follow. As I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks so much for being with us. Until next time, take care. <laughs>